Welcome to Build. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at the Build studio in New York City. Now, we here at Build are big fans of the Dodo, and as such, are very excited about their brand new show, Dodo Heroes, which airs on Animal Planet Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you've got to check it out, guys. The show features inspiring stories of animals in need from around the world and the remarkable humans who go to extraordinary lengths to give them hope. Joining me momentarily are two such heroes and some of the most effective animal crusaders in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, founders of Animal Defenders International, Jan Kramer and Tim Phillips are here. How about that, huh? How about that? Make some noise for Jan and Tim. Now, before we bring them out, I believe we have a trailer for the show, so let's go ahead and run that clip. If we protect the weakest, the most vulnerable, you can change the world. I lose sleep all the time thinking, can I help this animal? Sometimes I'm the last line of defense to save their life. I'm gonna go to all the lengths in the world for Ponzo. It's puppy time. I definitely have a place in my heart for the dogs of Afghanistan. We won't be satisfied until every single circus cage is empty. There are over 3,000 captive elephants in Thailand right now. That has to be stopped. Are we going to rescue a koala man? Yep. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Get straight into the shade, please. It's a little girl. We've got a baby in there. If we can get her into better shape, then they've both got a chance. This is probably my most anxious moment by far. This could actually save Jabu's life. This world is better because Jabu is in it. And although I love the moments that I spend with him and I'm going to miss it, he needs all the chums. <laughs> oh, look at these. Six, I, I couldn't bear to think what would happen if we couldn't reunite that dog with his soldier. Hey, little ones, I know. We all want to be loved. Happy. He's happy. We all want to be safe. <laughs> you ready? We all want to be free. Bye, Christy. It's absolutely magic to see their spirit. It's like they, they come to life. Ladies and gentlemen, Jan Kramer and Tim Phillips. Please, don't be shy. Yes, yes. We're going to do that a lot. We're going to be doing this a lot, you'll see. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it is an honor to have you guys here with us. Thank you so much for inviting us. Pleasure to be here. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I got a chance to see your episode of the show. We're going to talk all about it. It's, it was a phenomenal adventure, and I felt like I was right there. I really enjoyed it. But I, I, I want to go back a little bit first, because I was reading, doing my research here. ADI founded 1990, is that right? Almost 30 years now. That's correct, yes. Wow, it's incredible. 30 years, and you guys ha have successfully helped to... Uh, uh, eliminate wild uh, uh, circus practices in 40 countries, right? The, the band were outlawed, and so 40 countries now all over the world, and you guys have made that happen. Is that right? Absolutely. Over 40 countries, and very much uh, a movement generated by people, by the public, pushing governments into doing the right thing. And, and helping these animals find sanctuary, get them uh, released and, and, and transferred and all that stuff. 40 countries. Let's go ahead and applaud for that, please, guys. <laughs> Two people. One organization, 40 countries, all right? Uh, that's an incredible thing, and it's a very inspiring thing, and, and it's amazing that you guys have done that and devoted your lives to that. And it, and it begs the question, if you can take me back to, to 1990, what was the impetus for this journey that you guys are on now? What, what sparked it all for you? Well, yeah, really for animal defenders, we'd both been campaigning since the 1970s and 80s on uh, uh, animal rights. Yeah. Um, Someone gave me a leaflet in the street in the, about 1976 and it was about beagle dogs smoking cigarettes and that was the life change. Uh, it was just so much more important than uh, what I was doing and a similar, Tim had a, a similar story. Um, but in 1990, the world was changing in that people were becoming aware not just of issues with other animals that share our planet but uh, with um, global warming the way we were treating the earth, 
And uh, to us, they were all connected. This is all part of the same attitude of the way humans treat our planet and the other species who also live here. Yeah. I think uh, one of the key things is what's perhaps distinctive about Animal Defence International is our modus operandi. And we're, we're very much start to finish continuously campaigning. So we put people undercover in places like circuses, laboratories, gathering evidence. We add to that scientific research and economic research. We then go to the, the public and try and get public support behind it. Then we go to the legislators, try and get laws, and we just keep going. And once we have those laws enforced in countries like Bolivia, Peru, and now Guatemala, where we're working at the moment, we then help them enforce them. So it's it's keeping that continuum going. That was the thing, too, that struck me, was that you've put all this time into raising that awareness, to it, getting everybody educated, getting the laws in place, and, and finally the laws are there. And for a lot of people, you go, that's the victory. We did it. And it's like, no, you're still there, because now you have to make sure the laws are being enforced, and even that you guys are doing. Uh, you mentioned something uh, very early there, the, the undercover aspect, the infiltrating uh, uh, the, the industry and things of that nature. I read somewhere, that you were undercover for two years, is that true? Or is it two years cumulative? Is it, what, what? Uh, the, uh, for, for the circus campaign in yeah. Latin America, our guys worked for two years undercover. Um, uh, it started um, at a conference in Chile in uh, 2002, I think, yeah, 2002. And um, Tim and I were at the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, where all the governments get together and decide which animals are going to live and which animals are going to die. Every couple of years, they get together and make these decisions. And uh, we were lobbying at that conference, and we found just half an hour away a chimpanzee in a circus. Um, you know, Ascites, the most protected species, one of Ascites listed one species, and he was in a circus. Um, so we, we rescued Toto, and we eventually took him back to Zambia, and uh, we put him with a... He got his chimpanzee family. Um, but it really set South America alight, and uh, we got a team of un undercover people to work in, in circuses in several countries for two years. And that's really what got us the evidence that made the difference. Um, we launched a campaign to the public, to the legislators, to the media, showed them what we found, and people in Latin America were absolutely horrified that they were taking their children to see these shows where behind the scenes, animals were being beaten and starved and treated in the most disgusting, appalling ways. And it really just swept the continent. I think we got, within a few years, we got about five bands together but we did know that we had to go and finish the job. You yeah. can't just get the law changed. You've got to make sure it's enforced, and you then you've got to save that. the animals. Yeah. You yeah. guys had to learn that as well, that that was part of it. Yeah. 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 yeah it, it was, I was kind of blown away. I was looking at, I think it was maybe on a blog post or something you wrote, that New York City only had an official law in place banning it last year. As of a year ago, because I was thinking this had to have been uh, founded in the 90s. What was my life like in the 90s? I was a kid. And I remember circuses were a beloved, in, uh, beloved institution at the time. You didn't know any. You know, Ringling Brothers, they were all over the TV, the commercials, they were all the time. So I imagine, w what has, has the job gotten easier as people have gotten more educated? Or are you finding every, it's just the same level of tenacity is required all over the world? It hasn't gotten any easier. Well, uh, the, the key is... Awareness. That's, yeah. that's why it's so important being on shows like this and talking to people and giving people the facts. That's why we do these relentlessly long undercover investigations, because the, the only way you find out about how these animals are trained is by our hidden cameras in the barns and in the sheds where people think they're not being watched and they're beating these animals and they're chaining them and they're depriving them. And that Evidence as it has gained more and more momentum, particularly from our big European investigation in 1998, that's what's changed everything. And it's pushing that evidence. The surprising thing is the United States, where they, there, there isn't a big appetite for animals in circuses here. That, that's why Ringlings has closed. But the politicians are slow on this, and that's why people need to get on the phone to their members of Congress and ask them to back the legislation to end this suffering here. It's happened in 40 other countries. It's happened in Guatemala. It's happened in Mexico. It's happened in Bolivia, Peru, Austria, Portugal. Surely it should be happening here. 
you know, you talk about how the awareness is a big part of it, and the, like the dodo shows like this. You, you had your uh, beautiful documentary, the, the Lion Arc, there, which was amazing. Um, let's let's get into this. Let's talk about this episode and, and, and this process here. How did it all come together? Did the dodo reach out to you guys? Did you hear about it through the grapevine and the, and, the, and the community? What 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 sparked this? How did we get here? Well, we we filmed the rescue in 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 Peru. We we rescued over 120 animals in Peru. We emptied wow. every single circus. We there's not a single circus animal left in Peru. We rescued bears. We rescued monkeys, lions. Tim, I'm going to hold you for one second. Can we applaud for that? 120. That's amazing. So you got them all. Yeah. How often do you get to say that? Do you get to have that sense of accomplishment that we rescued all the animals? I, I think that that's why we feel this work is so important because there are many, many animals around the world that need to be saved. Yeah. But these types of rescues where you're encouraging governments to actually enforce laws, where you empty all of the cages, it sends a clear message and it leaves a legacy. It's not just these animals. It's all those future animals that would have suffered there, the, the other Pepe's that would have been torn from the wild and put on chains for years and had their teeth broken. That door has been shut for that suffering. So that's why we focus on these big rescues. That's why we're down in Guatemala right now rescuing lions and tigers. It's unbelievable. Uh, you know, we actually have a clip from your episode real quick that I want to take a look at. It's pretty amazing. If we can go ahead and run that real quick. When these lions come out and they walk on grass, it will be the first grass they've ever felt in their lives. Because he's lived in a cage all of his life, Leo wobbles a bit as he walks. You can see he has no muscles on his hind quarters. This today is going to help him build up muscle a little for when he goes to Africa. It, it's absolutely magic to see something wake up in them. That's just play lion style. They're a little bit tougher than we are. seeing them running and jumping and rolling over, chasing things and just engaging. It's like they, they come to life. Every life is important. Man. It's incredible. I, something that you don't, that you, you get in the full episode, but you don't get because of that, because it's just a clip, is the stark contrast in their behavior from when you guys first find them at the circus and that moment there. Because as, as great as that clip is as a standalone, when you see it within that context and you watch that transformation as a viewer, oh man, have tissues, guys. It's amazing uh, the impact that, that just grass has on these animals. Uh, it's something yeah. that simple. What what was, if you could remember from, from that rescue, the period of time that sort of transpired between, how, how much time passed between when you found them at the circus and when they stepped on that grass? How long was that? Um, that was probably about uh, uh, six months or so, I think. Wow. Um, because we, we had quite a lot of animals to collect, and uh, so we were gradually building that, that rescue center that you see. We've been, we were gradually building it up as we went from circus to circus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for that rescue, um, we started the, uh, the raids on the circuses. We did the first couple, and then they phoned the others, and they all ran. Scat they scattered. Yeah, they went into the mountains, into the Andes. They went into the jungle. And so the reason that one took so long, it was about 18 months in all, um, was that we had to go and find them again. And we had to gradually track, track them down. But it was important not to give up. It was important not to go away. We had to show them that whatever they did, we were going to come and take the animals. So e each of those things that you see, that gradual transformation of the animals was over um, several months. And certainly for the lions, it's like... 
when you first meet them, they're just blank. They're just oh, completely yeah. mentally closed down. And it's a bit like if I asked you to, uh, said to you, you had to live in your bathroom for the rest of your life and just look out the window and no one speaks to you and no one interacts with you. And that's what they're like. So that's why you see they're just amazed when they touch grass and they're yeah. just amazed when they first feel, feel their first push. Yeah, incredible. It's pretty incredible. Incredible is the word for sure. Uh, we're we're running a little. We're going to throw to audience in just a second. We're going to take some questions from the audience. But there's another segment of the show I absolutely loved, uh, and that is Mr. Pepe the monkey. There, uh, have, have you gotten? You talk about this in the episode that part of this process is you have to say you have to learn to say goodbye, which is uh, always hard. Sometimes harder than others, especially with a, a character like Pepe who you really bond with. Uh, have you ever had an opportunity to go back and see any of the rescues? Maybe by just happenstance that you're in that area again, bringing more animals to that. Do you ever get to follow up with the rescues and see them again? We do. We do. Yeah, we, 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 we regularly check in on them. We were with Pepe just a, a few weeks ago, in fact. Oh, and no he now has a whole family of spider monkeys there. He's the, the big boss man, and new arrivals oh. come. He'll groom them and check them. And he, he greeted us, and he has his kingdom there <laughs> you know they can't go back in the wild some of these animals yeah. they, they broke off pepe's teeth and he was chained alone for almost eight years and so so they're damaged psychologically and physically but what we do is we try and get animals back to their natural habitat you, you can't beat nature for its richness of entertaining these animals so we we went to a, a place in the the amazon forest and we built the enclosures around natural habitats. So these spider monkeys are swinging around the trees and, and having a good time. You see some of that at the end of this show. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I'd say about the, the, the show is that when people talk about the circus suffering like Jan and I, people might be worried about watching this. But it's actually this, the whole program is the transformation of these yeah. animals. It doesn't dwell on the suffering of them. It's kind of like you've been saying, your eyes open to it as you see them get more. When Pepe is cut from his chains, you suddenly think, wow, he was chained for eight years. It was a staggering deprivation. And then when he meets his own kind and you see him playing and the joy in him talking, he hasn't talked to that point. Those are the points you realize looking back as that joy comes into his life and he, he becomes a spider monkey again yeah. in many ways. He, he really does. Then that is the joy of the show is, uh, is seeing them have that moment and that you have cameras there for that moment to catch that sort of rebirth and, and rediscovering like themselves and whatnot. It's crazy, man. It's a spiritual thing. And that's why I was saying backstage and I say here, it's an honor to meet you because you've made that possible. You've done that. Uh, there was one last thing I wanted to ask you guys about. Uh, I was reading uh, up some stuff in there's this quote uh, talking about the undercover work and, 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 you know, going in all the raids. And it says, from your courageous and risky work, you are the recipient of numerous. And I'm like, oh, sweet, awards. Let's see, what did they win? And then it said death threats. And I was like, whoa, what? And, like, <laughs> I was blown away. Uh, I thought it was going to end a completely different way. But, yeah, if you watch this show, when you get to the circus, there's a heavy police presence that you guys roll with now, I imagine, because uh, I had no idea that it got that real, that you guys were facing literal death threats over all of this work you were doing. And then I started thinking about it. I guess, yeah, in a way, to, to those people, this is their livelihood, and so they get pretty aggressive about it. But has it always been that way, that from the beginning you knew this was something that you'd have to develop a thick skin for and you were ready for, or did you have to learn over time how to, how to handle that and compartmentalize those kinds of things? Because that's crazy. Yeah, I, I think we did really, didn't we? We uh, um, very, very early on in uh, uh, when we kind of went face to face with the circuses, we knew that we were making them very angry. Yeah. Um, we'd been instru instrumental offers, often in getting the law passed, and then we were coming and taking the animals. And I think um, well, we I think pretty much annoyed them. But people often ask, are, are you scared or anything like that? And yeah. what, what are you afraid of? And so on. I mean, Jan's probably the bravest person I know in the world. <laughs> Myself, not so much. But um, <laughs> you go into this situation, and genuinely, your only fear is that you're not going to go away with the animals. Yeah. And, and often, you've got butterflies of fear that this is somehow going to get closed down. And, and you see a touch of that in, in this episode where we went into this circus and it was pretty nasty shouting and so on. No, no, no 
real physical threat, but it, it was nasty atmosphere to work in. It took about eight hours, and then come the end of the day, they said, you're going to take three lions. You're going to take Kiara and Ray and Amazonas, and you've got to leave behind until the courts deal with it, Pepe, Kiara's cubs, and, and Smith, this lion. And it was just devastating. You know, we, we just thought we'd lost them. We, we tried to go to court the next day. We failed. And we, so then we drove back to, to Lima with the lions, and it was a 36-hour journey over the Andes. And it was just silent. You know, to save these three animals was something. We had Kiara. She's just wailing for her cubs. And um, we just felt we'd failed them all. Yeah. And then we did go back and get those animals, which made it extra sweet and it's captured in this program. Yeah, absolutely. You get the phone call on the TV show like the next day. Was it that fast? Or like is that we have 40 minutes to tell a story it's, kind of thing? It's an thing. extraordinary run of events this week yeah. because people attack animal, uh, get attacked in circuses every now and again regularly. Most circuses have had uh, some incident where a member of the public or a trainer has been injured by an animal. So on the Monday we, we went in and raided the circus. We finished about 10 o'clock at night. We stayed over on Tuesday and we uh, tried to get a legal action going, failed, so we gave up and about five in the morning on Wednesday we, we left and headed back to Lima. We arrived in Lima on the Thursday and uh, there was lots of media. We, 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 we'd kept this secret for the first three circus raids to try and catch them by surprise but it was all breaking out everywhere. That night, the circus carried on as normal, and they had this extraordinary act, the most irresponsible act ever, where this big male lion would go up on a platform, and they'd go, come on out of the audience, somebody, he's going to jump over you. And you don't put, a, even, you wouldn't even put a domestic cat above <laughs> someone to play. Of course, he attacked this woman. It, it goes absolutely viral. And our phone on the Friday is ringing off the hook, and there's two camps saying, kill this lion, he's attacked a person, and us saying, the only person didn't want to be in that circus ring was that lion. By the Monday, we were back in Cusco working to get him. And I said to Jan that morning, I said, he's either saved them all or they're going to kill him. Yeah. And we did not know until we got there. Uh, incidentally, miraculously, the person that was attacked did survive. We do see a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. it's... Uh, it, it's a wild story. Honestly, it really is. And uh, I can't thank you guys enough for being here. We're going to take the questions from the audience, but I'm going to say it again. You're doing incredible work. Uh, it's an honor to be able to meet you and speak to you. Thank you for everything you're doing for these animals and all over the world. It's, we're, we're a better place because people like you out there doing this work. It's dangerous. It's crazy and it's necessary. And you guys really are. Both of you are brave. Both of you are very brave. Thank you. Let's applaud a little bit. For these amazing guests here, Jan and Tim. All right, we got microphones in the room. We're going to take some questions. Looks like the first one's right here on the blue couch. Hi, guys. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, for your work, um, how do you guys find your information about uh, these animals? Like, um, Do you do your research on um, the different places that you go to prior to uh, checking those out? We, we do. It's a, lot, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of research in each country about um, who the circuses are, what animals do they have. Um, we have volunteers who go around, follow the circuses, find out all about the animals. And uh, then we talk to the governments about ha uh, what's possible. Uh, most governments, uh, the thing they're most worried about when they pass the law is, what do we do with the animals? It's large numbers of animals and where do they put them? And if something happens to the animals, then the public are going to be very angry with the government. So basically, we're helping them overcome that problem. And it is a lot of research. About how much time do you have to put in before you pull the trigger and go and move and actually move in on a place and do a raid or something? How, how long is that research process and that data acquisition process? Well, uh, to get a law through is, is a slow process. Yeah. Doing it, f in, for example, in South America, and it's kind of the model we use here in the U US and in the Europe as well. So we recruited the undercover team in 2005, 2004, 5. They were embedded for two years. I mean, the, the reason it was successful was the level of evidence that came out. It wasn't yeah. this one bad apple or that one. Um, then in 2007, it was launched. We began getting the first laws in 2009. Uh, Peru was 2012. The enforcement year was 2014. So you've just got to keep going. And you don't win on the first attempt. I mean, 
Yesterday, there was a vote in New Jersey where the, uh, the Senate voted overwhelmingly, unanimous vote, 37 to 0, said ban the use of wild animals in circuses. And we've just learned today it's not been given time on the agenda on Thursday, which means it's going to fall and we're going to just have to start again. So all those campaigners down there in New Jersey, including our team, just have to pick themselves up and keep going. That's the nature of, of working for animals. You get knocked down a lot, but the prizes are there to be taken because the public don't want to see this abuse. We're, at the moment, we're letting these people get away with doing it, and they need to be stopped. That's, that's amazing. What, uh, we're going to take one more question. What do you think of or what do you do to keep going? What keeps you going? If this is the nature of the job, how do you do it? Pepe? <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Yeah. I get that. Um, but, but I think also we're, we're very conscious of, uh, you know, if we um, feel that we've got to dig in and work harder, we've got to do more, we're very conscious that we don't pay the price if we fail. Um, it's the animals who pay the price. We can just we can go home and we can continue, but but they can't. So uh, the, apart from the fact that we really like to see these laws succeed and we like winning and seeing the animals released, we know that they're totally dependent on us. So that keeps us going. And I think you grab these magical moments. You've pointed out a few in this program. These these moments where you see, see a. a just two weeks ago, we got this tiger out of a circus cage, and he just began to frolic in the, the hay. Just a bit of hay. He had nothing before. Great big male tiger. And he began to roll and play. And you hang on to those bits, like, like you do in any other part of your life. The good parts drive you on, and you remember those bits when you seem up against it. The bits of despair are the politicians who won't listen and, and all of that kind of thing. And you just have to speak louder and louder and louder. Amazing. Oh. I think also just one of the things that we wanted to achieve with this show and, uh, and, and I think that, that, that we have is for all the talking about laws, for all the campaigning, for all the reports and, and the films, we want pe wanted people to connect with the actual animals, the, the living, feeling, intelligent beings who were being used and abused because there was no law to protect them. And that, and that was kind of really important that people could see exactly who they are as individuals, which is why Pepe you know is such a good spokesman. Pepe is a phenomenal spokesman, yeah. Uh, and this show really does do that. We've got one more, Liz. All right, let's go ahead. we got one last question. Hi, I'm just wondering what else we can do besides call our representatives to help and pass laws and raise awareness. Uh, well, I think uh, there's so much you can uh, help us by volunteering, either either locally or uh, online. Um, we're always looking for vol volunteers to come and help with uh, not just the rescues, um, but the animal care, um, but the creating awareness, you know, going and speaking to other people about it, going into schools and talking to people about what happens to animals and why we need to change things for animals. Um, there's just so much, um, it really depending on the kind of strengths of the person. Um, definitely volunteering and getting involved and coming on our Facebook and helping. And uh, helping raise awareness and money too for the animals. We've got 14 um, big cats in Guatemala now that we're feeding every day. And so we need to raise money for their food. I think that... Animal Defence International is a group that tries to empower people. And, and I, I encourage everyone, that you feel you're up against the state and the industries and so on, but it takes surprisingly few people to make a difference. And you say, you know, what apart from contacting your member of Congress or whatever, I know loads of people who've been on demonstrations all of their lives. They've never been to visit their member of Congress. So usually it's about taking those small things that you do and doing a bit more. I wrote the email to my member of Congress. Now I'm going to go and knock on his door. And that's how change comes about. And whether it's in Bolivia or Peru or the United States, it is surprising how few people it takes to change the world and get the word out there and encourage their friends. And the other big one is do please send a donation to ADI. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, all right. Well, that's all we have for now. Thank you so much for your questions, guys. That was wonderful. Uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap things up here, but I would be remiss not to remind everybody that the Dodo Heroes is airing on Animal Planet Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Pacific Time. Uh, and you're gonna, if for nothing else to see Pepe in action, you want to tune in. It's a phenomenal show. You are phenomenal people. Thank you so much again for being here. Everybody make some noise, please. Thank you. Thank you. For Jan and Tim. Come on. Round of applause.